Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Exciting to be here. Thanks, Amy, for inviting me. So we have a few more minutes that we will be waiting as people join in and we'll be starting in just about one more minute. So while we are waiting, we will let you watch a fun video of a dancing robot from Boston Dynamics. So welcome everyone. And this is one of my favorites. It is pretty funny. Okay, that that's kind of fun. There we go. Great. All right, one more minute. I know these people at Boston Dynamics are having a lot of fun. <laughs> okay so should we uh should we get started do you want to open it up all right yes thank you everyone and a welcome to today's business essentials session connect and compete in a virtual world my name is amy stark and i'm the director of administration for fcsi the americas I'm excited to host this first event in our Biz Essentials series. This series was created to help our consultant members run their businesses better with various topics throughout the next year. Our conference planning committee members and staff sorted through many topics and identified key issues we think our consultant members will find beneficial. But we welcome all your suggestions you may have for future webinars. You can contact me with your suggestions. My email is in my uh, screen name. Each event in our Business Central series will take place on the second Wednesday of the month, beginning on September 9th. Don't worry, we're still hosting our happy hour sessions. We've now moved them to the fourth Wednesday of every month, also beginning in September. We appreciate the support from our corporate members who have already committed to sponsoring future webinars. We still have sponsorship opportunities available. Each sponsoring organization will receive a three minute spotlight to showcase their company or product if your company is interested in sponsoring a future webinar, you can learn more through the link in the chat window. You may notice that your video and your audio are off. If you have questions for Deborah, just share them in the Q&A feature on your Zoom window. And if you miss anything, don't worry, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our website. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. I'm happy to, to be here with Deborah Jasper, uh, CEO and founder of Mindset Digital. Deborah and her firm help leaders in hospital networks, healthcare organizations, and Fortune 100 firms communicate with clarity and impact in a virtual age. Deborah has given talks around the world from Australia to Dubai. Thousands of professionals are enrolled in her firm's highly engaging programs that drive new habits and measurable results. And with that, I turn it over to Deborah. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here talking today about how to do business in a virtual world. As Amy mentioned, I am Deborah Jasper, founder and CEO of Mindset Digital, and we help organizations compete in today's virtual world. And we know the challenge. How do we do business? How do we create impact in this new world of social distance where events and restaurants and all kinds of things, at least for now, have dramatically changed. And virtual is the new reality. For the next year or so, we know that we're gonna be doing business in new ways. We all know that this crisis has had a huge impact. You all know this firsthand. You know, so many of the things that we love about education and about networking and about connecting with our clients and our colleagues is not happening right now. We can see some of the big events like Facebook and Microsoft are saying their big events aren't coming back until next summer. And restaurants aren't as crowded right now as they usually are. I cannot wait 
until we all feel like we can pack into a restaurant again. So in the meantime, Zooming through our daily work has become the new normal. And that means we have to make sure our emails, our messages, our marketing, our virtual meetings, our virtual client presentations, and our online presence has to be designed for today's virtual audience. So I am leading an entire uh, web series on this. We have two more webinars coming up, one on writing for action, one on leading virtual presentations. But today, we really are gonna focus on your online presence because that is the first step to making sure that you're effectively doing business with power, clarity, and impact. I'm gonna to talk today about three steps to build those powerful connections so that you can compete in today's virtual world. As Amy said, if you have questions, be sure to type those in. I will be taking questions before I wrap up. And I really wanna hear your feedback and hear your thoughts. So I, for one, really miss these big events. I'm a keynote speaker. I do a lot of big talks with you know, great lighting and amazing music. And there's always good energy, a lot of personal interaction. And at least in these events, you have some expectation of attention. Today, what's hard is you may be talking to your client. Maybe the cat is walking past their screen. Maybe they're getting up to get a, grab a cup of coffee. They're getting a lot of interruptions. As a speaker, as a salesperson, whatever you're doing as a project manager, you have to fight for the client's attention and attention in this new virtual world is everything. The big challenge, of course, is it's not just that the client has less time and their attention spans are shorter. We just have less space to communicate in. Maybe they're on their phone talking with you or they're on their laptop. That means building these strong virtual networks and knowing how to do business on a small screen is more critical than ever. And building those relationships virtually in ways that drive results means that knowing how to use LinkedIn is even more important than it's ever been. So we're gonna talk about three steps now for doing business in this world of social distance. And the first is you've gotta power up your online presence. People are looking you up before they decide whether to take that call if you haven't Googled yourself lately, I highly recommend at the end of this webinar, <coughs> excuse me, you just Google yourself and take a look at what comes up. Often if I Google you, the first thing I'll find, because there's a lot of SEO, a lot of search engine optimization behind it, is your LinkedIn profile. Your clients are going to your LinkedIn profile, your peers, your partners, your colleagues. It's definitely a great platform for thought leadership and even journalists may be looking you up on your profile. So you have to ask yourself, are you creating the right impression? Visiting profiles is actually one of the most common activities on LinkedIn. You've got to think about this as the microsite of you. So what is the biggest profile mistake that I see every day? It's really what you're sharing. You're thinking of it as a resume. So often we see people sharing, I've been in business for 20 years, maybe the history of your organization, a little bit about your education, your awards, you're thinking of it as a resume. When really what people wanna know is, do I wanna work with you? Do I like you? <laughs> uh, what are you gonna do for me? Can I relate to you and are you credible? And profiles often just don't answer those questions. You know, I'm looking for a thumbs up on those questions. So your online presence, the, most two, the two most important questions you should be answering is how do you help people like me? And why should I work with you? Take, I wanna show you a few examples of this. So we did a profile makeover for Rick, uh, the CEO and founder of City Barbecue Group. We often, for senior executives, we'll just do the makeover for you. We write that, we interview you, we write it, we do all of it. When we met Rick, he did not have a profile on LinkedIn. Look at what he's doing after. You should uh, Google Helm, uh, take a look at Helm. I like his branded background, it's very much you know, reminds you of barbecue. His image is, it's the right theme. It's a, a compelling about section. It's very skimmable. He has keywords to make sure that his visibility goes up. And it's, and when I say compelling about section, it's much more engaging. Growing up on a farm in Kansas, I love food and agriculture. It's not just the food, you know, but the idea that surrounds it, a meal that brings people together. So really thinking about telling me in your profile, don't tell me what you do, tell me what you love about what you do. That makes such a big impact when I look you up online. Another great example is Dan. We were working with him from Farmer's Restaurant Group. 
he had a pretty good profile before, after it's so much more compelling. Again, branded background, that engaging about section. He's doing a lot of active thought leadership, and I'll talk about why that matters so much. He does a nice job conveying his credibility. And again, that engaging about section. Notice it's written in the first person. He's talking about why he co-founded the restaurant group, what he loves about it. I also like he's, he's making it about doing good in the world. You know, we've got to be thinking about what we as an industry can do to improve the health and the health, our health and the health of the world. You know, we especially, we like doing business with people who are doing good in the world. You don't just want to tell me your story. You want to show me your story. So just take a look. You're seeing this happen in healthcare where people are really thinking about how to brand themselves on LinkedIn, how to make a powerful online presence really just pop. Whether you're in financial services, you're seeing it in insurance, Nationwide, AIG, all of um, our major clients are just doing more in, in thinking through their online presence. You know, this is Jim Curley. We worked with Jim. We are the exclusive training partners of the Limera Association. It's a big insurance association. As a chief membership officer, would you rather do business with the, the guy on the left, you know, or the guy on the right? I mean, Jim Curley, his after profile really does do a much better job of reflecting who he is. So your profile should make you look like an influencer. And especially, I would say, in the food business, <laughs> you have a lot of great opportunities for beautiful branded backgrounds. We've been doing some research this week, and there's just a lot of great ones out there. So I want to give you three fast fixes today for your profile. If you do nothing else, think about these three. Your first fast fix is improving your background image. So think about there's branded backgrounds. I like Jonathan's. I think that's really nice in the commercial kitchen space. You know, here's a nice branded background from Ohio Health. So branded or where you have your logo really branded in the background. Sometimes people just choose to do themes, you know, really beautiful visual themes. I like Jeremy's, again, really nice foodie background. I really like Jay's in the commercial kitchen. You think about if you're in the commercial kitchen space, that is a really nice branded background. Or not branded, but theme background. And Kathleen's is terrific. It's visual, it's colorful, just really nicely done. You think about it, who would you rather work with? If you're looking these folks up, you want to work with people who look really savvy. And the folks on the right with the visual background look much more savvy. The second part of your image you want to be thinking of is your photo. The number of unfriendly looking people <laughs> on LinkedIn is always a surprise to me. You're also just super formal and grim. So you're seeing people in all kinds of industries rethink their image and make it much more personable and engaging. So really thinking about a great image matters a lot. This, these are great examples of compelling images, friendly people, and an added bonus, you're 14 times more likely to be found when you post your picture. Just make sure it's a great one. So the bottom line is you wanna look awesome. Even if I just call you up and glance at your profile, I, wanna make, I just wanna come away with a good first impression of you. So if you don't have a five-star profile, you really should prioritize it because especially today in this virtual world, we are looking you up you know, before we decide whether we wanna do business with you. As we chose said, we did a LinkedIn makeover for him and did some coaching for his team down in Miami. He said his takeaway is you gotta lead from the front. And I think that is absolutely true. So a reminder, if you have questions on your profile, be sure to type those in and I will be taking those. The second fast fix is skip the blah, blah, blah. And here's what I mean. I've spent some time looking at folks in your industry I go back to this about section. I also like Audrey's background. Uh, <laughs> the about section is above your experience section. I've looked a lot of your members up and, and you guys aren't filling out your about section. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But that about section really is what is your story? As I said earlier, it should not be your resume. So here's what I mean. I see, and I just wrote this based on some of what I was seeing out there, but this is this is a good a kind of good generic example of what's out there. Integrated restaurant designer with 25 plus years of experience in hospitality, food service, corporate dining. 
we're just not reading this. You know, it's kind of jargony and not very engaging. And what is missing from this is what this person does for me. We also see a lot of of um, third person. Mark Smith provides comprehensive, you know, food design, project design in the food service industry and in healthcare and government sectors, is depth and breadth of knowledge, education and background. We call this the blah, 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 because you sort of stop reading. You know, his depth and breadth of knowledge and education, blah, blah, blah. You don't want to be this person on LinkedIn. Instead, you want to think about that about section. It's written in the first person and it's much more what are you focused? How are you helping me? So like this, I'm helping our restaurant clients, you know, from uh, develop a successful operation from the initial idea through opening day. If I'm a client, I'm like, oh, this is really powerful. You know, this person is focused on helping me execute on my vision and helping me develop innovative design. And then notice at the bottom, I still say a little bit of outside of work, You'll find me at the grill, you know, using my love of food to bring people together. Much more compelling story of you. And that's what you really want to be thinking about, you know, thumbs up. So resume like summaries are hard to read and really harder yet to give me a sense of connection with you. That's again why I go back to Kathleen's. I really like how she's describing, we're the people who create, improve and enhance kitchens. Okay, that is easy for me to take in. And I love using the power of networking to connect people. This is well written and well done. So that compelling first person summary really makes an impact on your clients. And you're sending out trust signals. So yes, you wanna be trustworthy and credible. You also wanna be likable and relatable. And that's the part that I think a lot of folks in this industry, especially the food service industry are missing. So ask yourself, if you called up your online presence, is it making the impression on your clients that you really want it to make? Because they may look you up by your name long before they'll look up your website. We did take a look, sort of randomly chose 14 uh, FCSI members to take a look at. And for all 14 had LinkedIn profiles, so that's good. 13 of you had a profile photo, yay. I'm not saying whether they're good photos or not. Uh, 14 had more than 500 connections, which is really terrific. Here's the challenge, here's the opportunity. Only eight of you had that custom header image, so you're missing a real opportunity for visuals and branding. Only four of you had a first person summary. Only six had visual galleries, and in your space, the opportunity for great visuals are really critical. And then here's the kicker. Five of the profiles had typos and grammatical and or grammatical errors. So really thinking about what impression are you making? At the very least, you want to fix those typos. Is your online presence driving business or driving it away? Do I call you up and go, eh, you know, would you meet with this person? Sort of incomplete, not personable. You want to think of your profile as a mini magazine bio that helps you drive new business. This is your reputation and clients and prospects are looking you up whether you realize it or not. The final quick tip is uh, be personable, not too personal. No photos of yourself and your husband or your wife at a wedding. You see all kinds of things like that. You can, do, you can get away with one away from work sentence. This is not Facebook, so don't overdo it. I was co coaching a C-suite executive, and we always say, away from work, what do you like to do? And he said, well, away from work, I like to play golf, but that's not very engaging. Instead, he decided, away from work, I'm an infrequent and frightening golfer. That is a much better, just funny, a little humorous, you know, gets to that relatability. Again, I'm going to go back to Kathleen. I like hers. When not in the office, I can be found cheering in the stands at the local ball field. Really nicely done. If you look at Rick, he says, I love challenges. I'm a pilot. When he's not in the office, he's flying single engine planes because the mental challenge is like nothing else. If you look me up on LinkedIn, I say away from work, you'll find me on the water, skiing out west or boating on Lake Erie. And I'll tell you, I have a great relationship with one of my clients now because when he looked me up on LinkedIn, he called and said, Deborah, I'm a huge boater. You know, what kind of boat do you have? <laughs> so we ended up in a great conversation about that. Again, it goes back to likability and relatability for your profile. Casual does not mean careless. There are a lot of business banking officers out there. 
you know, there are more misspellings of restaurant, you would be surprised. And uh, things like facilitation, <laughs> there's just, just proofread, proofread and proofread. If you do nothing else, proofread your profile. All right, step two, power up your network. And if you wanna connect in a virtual world, you know, you're starting with LinkedIn, it is the world's largest professional network. More important, it's a huge database. You need to develop the search skills that will help you make the most of it. Turns out we're five times more likely to engage through a mutual connection, which really doesn't surprise me. If someone I know and trust recommends me to someone else, or you know, recommends I meet someone, then I'll take that call. So are you really leveraging your first degree, second degree, and even third degree connections? And are you using advanced search? We do a coaching program called the Power Network Habit. We do a deep dive in this, but let me give you a little bit of highlights because I think it is critical. Suppose you're looking for restaurant owners in your state. If you just do a search, you may end up with 500,000 results. Not that helpful. If you start drilling down though and adding filters, you can add connections, you can add the, the filter of your city. So if I was searching by second degree connection and, I, uh, and I'm searching in Columbus, Ohio, which is where I'm based, I can get a thousand targeted results and they from people who know um, of names of people who know people that I know because we have second degree connections and if I add even more granular filters say I'm looking for restaurant owners that I have second degree connections with who are not only from Columbus but who went to Ohio State which is where I used to teach and where I got my PhD now I'm down to 271 filters or 271 people so think about that now I really have a great targeted list of client, potential clients. Then I can tap in the power of introductions. I can figure out who you know that I know, and instead of saying, hey, Bob, can you introduce me to some potential clients? I can say, I see you know Patrick. Could you introduce us? Much, much more powerful way to network and to expand your network and build your book of business. Um, and then you can do just really some fun ones. You can figure out anyone who went to the University of Oregon and oversees hospital operations. Maybe you do a lot of hospital kitchen design or prison kitchen design. You can see all the C-suite executives who are connected to your friend Mike, who happens to be a chef. I mean, there's a lot of great filtered searches that you can do and take advantage of. And then once you find those potential clients, you really want to pay attention to what they say they care about. You know, you can figure out how long they've been in their role, uh, whether they have a back, what their background is, where they went to school, who they know. You know, I was working with a client who was actually on the board of an animal shelter and I did rescue my dog. This is my dog, Mojo. Any excuse to show a cute photo of your dog <laughs> who I rescued 13 years ago. And then we ended up in a great conversation. We have a great relationship and it does just help you build those connections. So if you want to build the network that drives results, you know, you really have to think about how you're reaching out. So people don't like jargon in corporate speak. They want their interactions to feel human. You want the way that you're engaging with people to be interactive, to be personalized, and of course, just more engaging and interesting. What is the biggest mistake that we see in terms of engagement? It's the simple one. It's that you're reaching out to me with the default. And if you send me a note that says, hey, Deborah, I'd like to join your LinkedIn network, what you're really saying is you're not worth 15 seconds of my time to write a personal note, really. That says to me, you don't know me, or maybe we don't seem to have much in common, or you don't appear to know anything about my ideas or my work. Why would I accept that LinkedIn invitation? Instead, just add a quick note, you know, make it a little bit more personable. That personalization really matters. So if you're linking into clients you know, you know, good to see you here on LinkedIn. I look forward to connecting. Enjoyed our call today. I do not do a call with someone that I don't link in with either afterward or right before. I'm looking forward to our call or I enjoyed our call because that really builds out your database of connections. If it's potential clients, then maybe you're looking them up and see that they wrote an article or maybe they're signing up for one of your webinars or maybe you read some of their research on the impact of COVID on restaurant design. You know, say something about how you came up on them and why you wanna connect that's authentic. Don't just say, hey, I see we know a lot of the same people unless it's like 64 people. 
uh, because you really want to add a note and you want to add a note that has a little bit of meaning. Remember, you are your brand. Your team, if you have a team, they are your brand. You don't want to just be sort of passively waiting for invites. You really want to actively build the network that you need. So be thinking about how you're building out those connections and using filters and advanced search to find people because LinkedIn works when you work LinkedIn. Step three is really all about powering up your visibility. So to inform, you know, you must first engage. And we see people doing a little bit of this, like commenting, sharing, but not doing it in a way that's very strategic. So you do have to develop a content strategy. And I want to put the emphasis here on the word strategic because saying great article doesn't really give me a lot. I see people do this a lot. It's not very compelling. I'll go back to Dan. He does a terrific job. He has more than 7,000 followers. And he really is, I mean, he is posting some very insightful things. Here he's posting their health and safety dashboard. It was really amazing. Um, amazingly, he made a lot of information visible because he said diners deserve to know and restaurant workers deserve to know and we need to operate in the light, which I thought was just really fantastic. He showcases others, you know, congrats to the team at Plant Burger, hashtag conscious leadership. So, you know, I'm really, I watch his profile. I'm like, wow, I really like this guy. Um, and then you got to be real. We're in the office. Uh, now he, he was saying we closed down our corporate offices and now we're office nomads toiling away from our patios, right? Um, and we shut down our offices and I didn't think about posting something like this, but I think that it, it could be really cool and you're kind of allowing people to keep up with you and what you're doing. He also is just doing a lot of nice commenting and thanking people and responding to people, replying to people. Other folks, of course, are doing great stuff too, sending the hospitality business lots of care during crazy times. This is really your reputation. When you're active, it increases your reach and those small numbers can add up. Maybe you have 12 people comment on a post or maybe you have one really popular post a year, but that can be thousands of touch points with potential clients and really enhance your reputation out there for the work that you do. So be thinking about how you're, how you're raising your visibility. Any of your activity, by the way, if I go to your profile is visible. So if you go to my profile, you'll see that I'm talking to Jared, a guy um, at IEHP. I gave a keynote for them earlier this year, back when we could give keynotes, and I'm absolutely staying in touch with him. You know, I'm talking to people about our cybersecurity training. There's just a lot of, uh, your, people can go and see what you're doing out there and what you care about. There's a lot of information there. So, you know, really thinking through, not don't have a passive profile, make sure you're extending your reach and your reputation. And before I wrap up this webinar, I am gonna give you a, an easy way to figure out how influential you are and how to, LinkedIn has an algorithm for this and it will give you a score. But I wanna say of these three steps, virtual is the new reality. To compete, you must become a powerful virtual networker. You've got to develop a powerful online presence, really thinking about developing that strategic network, some smart thought leadership, which I'd love to get into. We don't have a lot of time in this short webinar, and really an action plan for how you're going to do that. So I, you know, we do deeper dives on things like thought leadership and groups and blogging and how do you take advantage of recommendations and all of those kinds of things. Again, a 45 minute webinar is not gonna quite get you where you need to be, but hopefully I've given you some really good takeaways today for what you can do that's super easy for right now. If you wanna do a deeper dive in this, if you're really thinking about, hey, Deborah, I really wanna raise my visibility, my connections, my credibility, my strategy, my business, we do have a, a six week, or it's now a five week in-depth coaching program and it's very popular. People are getting seven times more client meetings through LinkedIn. They're getting in the top 5% of social selling scores, a lot more connections on average. I think of it as, I sort of think of LinkedIn as the gym membership, which if I buy it, I sometimes don't go. Uh, we think of ourselves as the high performance coaches, uh, you know, and there's ways you got to build your profile, engage, power up your network, invest in your relationships, and then drive those client meetings. So if you're interested in that Power Network Habit Program and learning by doing, good news, 
because you're on the webinar today, you get a special promo code with $100 off. So put in FCSI 2020 and you can get a special rate on the Power Network Habit. You can also go to powernetworkhabit.com and get a, a LinkedIn, a free LinkedIn checklist to just sort of see how you're doing. Bottom line is our audience has changed, their expectations have changed, and we have to break through the noise. If we have any hope of, of making an impact in terms of where we are. Again, before I wrap up, I'm gonna take those questions, but let me give you a little bit about how, how to check, up, check out how influential you are. So hang on just a second, Amy. Go to a search, just when you hang up today, search the Social Selling Index and LinkedIn. This website will come up. You can put your name in and get your score for free. It's, it'll give you a score. This is Mike Taylor. He has a score of 84, which is super high. It's judging you on four dimensions, whether you've established a good brand, whether you're engaging with insights, uh, whether you have a robust network, and it'll tell you how you're doing within your industry. You're, you know, we like for people to shoot for a score of 60 to 70. So if you are, you know, in that, if you're at 60 or 70, you're doing really well. If you're lower than that, then you want to start to think about how strategically you're going to apply some of the insights that we gave you today. So at the very least, check your score, and then I'll wrap up with talking a little bit more about the adjustment we've made and how we work today. So Amy, what questions do we have? And I will go back so that people will know uh, if they want to do more on that promo code. So what questions do we have? Okay, so the first one we have, um, how do you get a five-star rating? That's a great question. So that five-star profile, we, we have put together that five-star rating, but here's what we're assessing. We are assessing visually, do you have the right image? Do you have a branded background? You know, do you look, do you, have you uploaded enough visual assets? So for example, if you have a video of yourself speaking or you have a video of some of the, or you have photos of some of the kitchens you've designed, so does it look good visually? Then we're assessing, that's one. Then we're assessing, um, do you have the right SEO, search engine optimization keywords? Do you have that first person compelling profile? Are your experience sections fully filled out, but are they short, organized, and skimmable? Not so filled out that I'm overwhelmed and don't wanna read them. Are you using action words? Are they well written? You know, so there's a lot that really goes into making sure that you're fully optimized, but it's a lot of what I, I talked about today great visual imagery, SEO, you know, good first person summary, fully filled out experience section. That's what gets you to a five-star profile. Excellent. So um, we also had a question about how often should you be updating your profile? You know, that is a great question. A lot depends on how much your business changes. And, and frankly, I need to go update my profile because we're now doing more virtual talks. And so I just realized as you asked me that question, it's a good time for me to go update and talk about the virtual talks that we're doing. So I think you should be updating your profile. I'm gonna give you, give folks who missed the, S, uh, the uh, SSI score, that information too. But I do think you should update it when something happens that, that you really wanna make sure your clients are aware of. I mean, I think people should, up, should be thinking about updating it at least two or three times a year with fresh content, fresh imagery if they can. Uh, if you've done something and you just love the opening, then keep it, you know, but, but it doesn't hurt to add in a few more details from time to time. Okay. Um, someone also asked visual galleries. You mentioned, where is this on LinkedIn? Oh, I should, if you search, uh, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you'll see my visual gallery. <laughs> so I don't have it to show it to you here, but that's a great question. I should build that in and show people where it is. It's below the, it's above the summary. Yes, it's above the summary. I'm trying to do this by memory now. I feel like I need to go search it. But, and you'll see, it's very easy to post images. You can post, uh, I, I have a uh, highlights reel video of my keynote talks, my live keynote talks. So, you, and I should post something like we do digital downloads. I should post something like that there. So if you're doing any kind of uh, video blogging or any of that, you can post that in your, visu in your visual gallery. Excellent. So next, asking for an introduction in that way. How many times is too many times to ask? 
I can see this. The question is, um, the person yes. says, I can see this potentially being a negative um, if it's overused. I agree with that. I, you can't ask over and over again. And part of it depends on how well do you know me, you know, and how much do you like me? So if you're a really close friend of mine and you know five people that I really want to know, I can certainly ask you, hey, can you give me those introductions? I do have a, a woman that I, there's a friend of mine, we are friends and I really like her a lot. And she called me the other day and asked me for two introductions and I did both of those. If she had asked me for three or four though, it would have felt like too much because we're all busy. So you want to use that judiciously, but frankly, we all have a lot of first degree connections. So even if we asked all of them for one, <laughs> you could really get, you could really expand your network pretty quickly and get a lot of client meetings. I did have someone the other day call and say, hey, Deborah, because we do coaching in this, and he said, I'm using a lot more of that introduction uh, technique, and he got 14 meetings in a week. So it really does work because, of course, if you, if you know Sarah and you really like Sarah and she loves you and she introduces you to people she likes, it's just so much smarter than reaching out to people cold. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rochelle had a question. Do you accept requests from people you don't know and haven't met? And so That's my favorite question. Um, yeah. Yes. I think of LinkedIn in terms of uh, two things. One, I ask myself, uh, do I know you? And the second question is, do I want to know you? <laughs> so, so if I don't know you and I know nothing about you, then I won't accept it if you've not written me a note and you look like you're going to pitch me, right? If you're telling me, oh, I'm a CEO coach, <laughs> then I'm like, okay, you're going to pitch me. So, uh, so that I don't do. And, if, and here's why. So Amy, if you accept a connection from someone who's kind of a spammer and then that person tries to connect with me and I go, oh, Amy's connected with him, you've loaned him your credibility. Right. So I try, and I'll tell you, sometimes I connect with people because I think, oh, maybe they saw me give a keynote. And then the first thing they do is pitch me on something. I'll go unfollow them or disconnect from them. So if you keep your network tight, don't connect with a lot of people who are pitching people because you're loaning them your credibility. Now, if you connect with me and you're the CEO of an organization that I really want to get to know, <laughs> or you know you just you look really credible and you're in my space then i will accept for sure but what you do next determines whether i stay connected to you well that actually leads to the next question which is what do you do with someone who does keep pitching to you so you've i disconnect yes what? yeah i just did and they don't get notified by the way you you guys so you can just disconnect it's not like linkedin sends a notification that says deborah disconnected from you so um, so I definitely dis I definitely disconnect. And then sometimes we get questions. I don't know if anyone asked this, but you know, one of the reasons that I'm talking about um, really making sure that you're engaging with insights is if you are trying to figure out how to get a call with someone, if you start to engage with them on LinkedIn, hey, that's a great post or a great article, or I really, but not just great article, more insightful. What I liked about this article is X. Uh, over time, they start to feel like you're in their network. And then it's much easier to say, I really enjoyed your latest research on, you know, kitchen design. I'd love to have talk with you for 15 minutes. So it's just, I'm much more likely to take a call if someone has read about some, you know, saw a keynote I gave and can tell me what they liked about it or just has, has a reason. I feel like they're more genuinely interested in me than just, hey, can I get a meeting with you? Because we're not taking those. Right. Okay. Well, that's all we have uh, in the chat box right now. If anybody Perfect. has any more. And if people have more, they should link into me. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's a great way to uh, uh, connect and you can ask me your questions and all of that. So make sure that you link, link into me. One of the uh, presentations that I'm going to be doing next, as you know, the next one is on writing for action. But after that, I'm going to be doing one on the art of a powerful webinar. And one of the things I say is never end on questions because you don't want to go away like we just did saying, okay, well, that's it. Well, okay, thanks. Bye. It just isn't very compelling. So you want to end with some key takeaways. You always want to give people three takeaways if you can. So, and I should have actually had a slide in here. So you guys can hold me accountable to this that said, if you do nothing else, make sure that you proofread your profile. Uh, really make sure you proofread your profile. Make sure you think about that branded background or at the very least, 
a beautiful background. In the food industry, you can do a beautiful background and think about that image. And then think about how you're engaging with people. You know, really uh, ask for four introductions. Just try it out and do it in a way that's not pitchy, but, you know, really start to engage with insights and reach out to people and start to leverage your network. So those are the takeaways. Look, we know we're working like this today and it is an adjustment. My favorite, of course, and people will talked about this was the guy in Good Morning America who just didn't realize that people could see that he was wearing shorts. <laughs> And I've got a whole lot more fun Zoom fails that I will share in upcoming webinars. I know, do you want to talk about this webinar with Karen, Amy, that's coming up on September 9th? Yeah, we have uh, our next event is September 9th with a panel of um, our of CSI members. And um, it'll start Wednesday, 3 p.m., just like today, Eastern Time. And um, we'll see everybody then. We're looking forward to it. And then my next webinar with you guys is Wednesday, October 14th. This is one of my favorites. I was a writer for 20 years uh, before I did this. My PhD is actually in the art of powerful storytelling. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. It's an educational policy, but that was my dissertation. So we're gonna talk about how to communicate with clarity and impact. We're gonna talk about the pain of email. You know, we are, when this comes in your inbox, are you excited? No, in fact, if it gets into your to-do Saturday pile, if you're like me, it gets into my to-do never pile. So we're gonna talk about our clients are in triage. They are not opening your emails. It's hard to get them to connect, right, via email. We're really gonna talk about how do you write for action. I think the new skill is how do you write for the phone. We're gonna help you make your emails and messages rock. So, and get to short, we call it SOS, short, organized, and skimmable, because it'll save time, drive action, and earn faster responses. And the reason that this, all of this matters, whether you're thinking about your presentations, your virtual presentations, how you're connecting and, and networking virtually, how you are writing for a virtual audience is because I think we're more in a virtual revolution now. You know, we, we call ourselves mindset digital because we've been, we're all about, you have to have a digital mindset. But at least right now, we really have to embrace a virtual mindset. And there's no going back. Of course, we are going to have events again, and we will get to pack restaurants again and all of that. But I think we're going to start doing more hybrid. I mean, I'm talking to my Fortune 100 clients right now, and they're saying, Deborah, uh, at our next event, even when we go live, we're going to do a virtual aspect to it. And I think we're just going to all have to embrace that in more meaningful experiences are going to need to make a big impact on a small screen. And I'm excited about thinking through how do we do this in really compelling ways and hearing from people as they're starting to leverage LinkedIn, as they're starting to write differently, as they're starting to present differently. And just all of us are figuring this out together. It's a cool journey, but it does require a lot of new thinking. So I wanna hear from you, please link into me. I can be the first person you write a personalized note to. That's another good takeaway. So send me a note. I want to hear how things are going as you're thinking through reimagining your LinkedIn profile. Tremendous opportunities for you to tell the story of you on LinkedIn. And I hope you will join us for the whole three-part small screen big impact series. So tune in to my next webinar in October on how to write for action. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, Lincoln, I want to hear from you all. And thanks so much, Amy, for hosting. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, guys.